All right, Genesis chapter 24. We left off at verse 54, 54. The context is, remember, Rebekah's family granted the servant Eliezer, uh, they granted his desire and his wish to take their daughter uh, Rebekah from their family and take him on a journey to meet Isaac. Recalling, fresh review again, Isaac is a picture of Jesus Christ, the Son, right? right. Son, Jesus. Then we've seen how Sarah pictured Israel. And that was the first love, or basically... God's first wife. But I showed you in the previous chapter the picture where Sarah died represented and symbolized God divorcing and setting aside his wife Israel because of her sin. And then chapter 24 is when God went after a new spouse, remarried, and that's the church. Abraham is supposed to picture God the Father. Eliezer is supposed to picture the Holy Spirit. So I will kind of put some little dotted lines here. That way people can know who's who. Okay? Amen. So Isaac is right here. And then Eliezer is right here. Remember, he was uh, sent a task by the Lord. Eliezer is the servant. And if you recall, Eliezer is supposed to picture the Holy Spirit. So I think up to here is okay. Eliezer is supposed to picture the Holy Spirit who's given a task by the Father to find a bride for the Son. And that's why when you got saved, you've been considered the bride of Christ. The Holy Spirit was seeking after you. You accepted his offer, and then the Holy Spirit became your guide after that. And then it's the Holy Spirit's job to guide you to the Son. So Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit. Rebecca, which is the wife, obviously, we know is supposed to uh, represent the church. Now, there's a lot more pictures here, and I'll show you soon. Laban, I mentioned this to you, he pictures the world. And Rebecca left the world. She left her old family for the new family. Picturing how the church or the saved Christian left their old family, the world, their old nature, and went into the new nature. They went into their new family, the family of God. That's a picture of your salvation. Now, notice how all these pictures tie together. It's amazing. I say all that because that way you can understand the next parts at verse 54. And they did eat and drink. He, Eliezer, and the men that were with him, the men who accompanied Eliezer, uh, and tarried all night. So they stayed all night, and they were partying, eating and drinking, uh, with Rebekah's family. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. Eliezer and the men, they got up in the morning, and Eliezer said to Rebekah's family, uh, Send me away. Uh, let me go so that I can go back to my master Abraham. Now remember the goal of this verse-by-verse -verse Bible study is for you to understand each and every word in the verse. So as I ex read the verse and then as I explain it, see if my explanation match with the verse. That will help you with your understanding. People say that the Bible's too hard to understand, 
But to be honest, it's like any other school textbook or uh, law book that you read. At the beginning, it might be foreign and strange to you. But until you get someone to explain the words and you get so used to it and you study yourself, you don't just listen. You study yourself, hear the explanation, see if the explanation matches with the text itself. Then it's going to open up your common sense gist. And then trust me, it'll open up Pandora's box when you read the scripture in the future as you get used to this type of teaching right. happens in any school class so, getting back to the text at verse 54 I mentioned that Eliezer he tells a family he wants to return to his master after staying up all night with them uh, enjoying a good time and then when he got up in the morning that's when he wants to go back to the father so the Holy Spirit it's a picture of Romans 13, where he is with the Christian church inside the world all night. The night rep represents the timeline of the church age today in this world. That's what the night is representing. So then the church that is in the world. That's the time the church is together. Uh, the church is in the world, not of the world, but is in the world. Rebecca no longer is part of the world. She becomes part of this family. However, Rebecca is still in uh, the world. She is still uh, in the residency of her family. You see that? The Christian church, let me repeat again if you didn't understand that, the Christian church is not of the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Rebecca is in the home of her old family, but she is no longer of her old family. Once the family said that you can take her, you can take our daughter, she is now a part of your family, she became a part of the new family. That's what happened automatically. So, that's what's going on right now in the church age. In the church age, we are in the night, and in the night, the Bible says, we are still in the world. We're not raptured. We didn't leave the world yet to go be with the Father. Even though th we are of this new family, Picturing Abraham's family, and we're not of this old family here, Rebecca's old family, uh, Rebecca's residency. Although we're not of that, we are in there still. We're not in here, we're in there. In this passage, Rebecca's in here, she's not in here yet. That's why this, this picture of the night matches well in Genesis 24, where Rebecca's still in the world, so to speak. The church is still in the world during nighttime. The church is still in the world during nighttime. Look at Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. Let me move aside here. Let me know if I'm cut off. Cut off. Yeah, right here? Right there. All right, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, <clears throat> for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So the Bible says right here that our salvation is close. So to be raptured up to heaven with God, to be saved out of this wicked world. It's nearer than when we believed, our rapture. Verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. See, that day that we're going to be raptured is almost right around the corner. The night we've been there far too long. Right. Hence, the verse is pointing out that the church is living in the night, in the world, until we get raptured up to heaven with him. Again, the night is the timeline. It is the timeline of the church being in the world right here. So it's like the church age, so to speak. But I'm going to show you something else where it's not really the church age, technically. But I'll explain that a little bit more later. If we go back 
we turn to Genesis 24. We turn to Genesis 24. Let's continue on with these wonderful pictures in the Bible. Eliezer wants to leave immediately. Notice that Rebecca's old family, notice that your old family, the world, does not want you to leave. They don't want you to go to the Father to be with the Son, Jesus Christ, up in heaven. Oh, but uh, they will tolerate God. I mean, they're not anti-God. They're like, sure, you can be a Christian. There's no problem with that. But then when actually your life gets sold out where I'm going to now go be with the Father and the Son, when the actual act takes place, the world all of a sudden compromises, says, oh, no, no, we're not telling you to separate from God, but it's just too soon to dedicate your life to Jesus to serve him. Let's compromise right here. Now, notice that Rebecca's family compromised. They were compromising with Eliezer. They were compromising with God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, let Rebecca just stay with us a little longer, just a little longer with the old family, the world with us. Look at Genesis 24. Look at this, verse 55. And her brother and her mother said, remember Laban's a type of the world? Remember this is her old family, the world? Let the damsel abide with us a few days. So please let this damsel, this young lady, Rebecca, they're referring to, stay with us for a few days. At the least ten, after that she shall go. The very least, let her stay for ten days. At the very least, ten days long, let her stay. And then she can go away. Just stay a little longer in the world and then you can go to church later. Do this fleshly thing, this worldly thing, and you can always do your Bible reading and prayer later. Isn't that what the world does? It compromises. It doesn't reject God. Remember this, the world don't reject God, even though technically they do, realistically they do. But what the world does is when it comes to their own comfort zone, they don't want to let that thing go. And then when it comes to reaching their comfort zone, they're not willing to let you go to God. They want to do a half-half thing. Remember, the devil always wants to compromise. The Lord, however, doesn't compromise things. He's either all in or all out. Verse 55, if the world does that to you, think about this, Rebecca, who is a type of the church, who was she before? Okay? Before you're a saved Christian, what were you before? Do you know? You're part of the world, but a Gentile, right? Part of the world, a Gentile. Now look at this right here. What is the number of Gentiles, if you recall, that I taught you in the Genesis studies? The number 10 is a Gentile number. We've seen that demonstrated many times in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 10 is one great example. It mentions Gentile over there. I believe it's the first mention or one of the first mentions. Uh, if you look at Acts chapter 10, the gospel finally directed from Jew to Gentile. It finally paid attention to the Gentile group. Acts chapter 10. You get 10 demoniac kings at the book of Revelation. What's that supposed to represent? Gentile kings, where the Gentiles under the rule and reign of the Antichrist will go against the nation of Israel. So 10 is all over throughout your Bible that refers to a Gentile number. And notice that's the case right here because Rebecca's old family, Gentiles, they say, stay with us for how long? How many days? Ten days. How about that? You know what that is? Let Rebecca stay with the Gentiles. Let your days, let's compromise with God. Let your days be a little bit of the world. 
Let your days follow along with the times of the Gentiles. Didn't you know that's a specific timeline that is mentioned in your Bible, times of the Gentiles? That's a biblical word for some of you who didn't know that. Times of the Gentiles in your Bible is referring to the lost people and the lost world who are not Jews. So currently, your UN is considered to be, in God's eyes, times of Gentiles, actually. The rule and reign of America is actually not a godly nation. For some of you who didn't know that, that might be shocking to you, but God don't consider it that way. He considers them at the timeline of times of the Gentiles. And when the Antichrist comes and then rules over the UN and the whole world, it's going to be called times of Gentiles still. Times of Gentiles began ever since Israel fell away to the, uh, to the Babylonian kingdom. And then God considers uh, the rulers of this world to be times of Gentiles, no longer his uh, nation of Israel. But that's a totally different teaching called Kingdom of Heaven, Kingdom of God, which I'm not going to get into. If you watch that video, it'll be very eye-opening on that one. Point is, returning to the main text, we are under the times of Gentiles right now. It is the Gentile nations, non-Jewish nations, that are actually ruling over the world. It is not the church. The Catholic Church would like to think so. Christian churches would like to think so. But they are not rulers in this world. All right, They are not rulers in this world. Uh, the Christian church is not the rulership or the kingdom of this world. It is actually the Gentile kingdoms. So when churches try to build up a kingdom and they're kingdom builders, that's why the Catholic church became infamous for the Inquisition, shed blood with the Muslims in the Holy Land, because both Muslims and then the Catholic church, they were thinking about building an empire together. But that is not the Christian church. God don't see it that way. He sees the physical kingdom of this earth ruled by Gentile nations. Not by him. God is not of this world. He won't have his worldly kingdom until the end, which is called the millennium. Again, that's called kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God doctrine, it, which any of you don't know, then just watch that video. You'll understand. So right now, the church is under the times of the Gentiles, and they want you to follow along their timeline. So... What's your timeline right now? What's your life? How are you spending your days and hours with God? According to the times of the Gentiles or, or according to the church age? Look at Ephesians 2. The Bible says when you lived your life with your old family, the world, with the Gentiles, you were living your days in the timeline of the times of the Gentiles. That's what the Bible says. Right now, you're not supposed to be living in the times of the Gentiles. You're supposed to be living in the church age. Right now, what's going on is two timelines going on right now. It is the church age versus the times of Gentiles. You know what Christian churches are trying to do? They're trying to go by times of Gentiles. Physical things of this world, the world, the world. No, we're not of the world. We're supposed to be living spiritually in the Lord. You're supposed to be in the spirit age, the Holy Spirit's age right here working in the night, the church age. That's your spiritual operation right now. Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read verse 11. Wherefore, remember that being in what? Time past Gentile. See that? In the past before, your times was like the Gentiles. In the flesh, see, you were living according to the flesh. Verse 12, that at that time, see, God considers a timeline right there. Those times of the Gentiles you were living in. You were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. So notice that you are separated from God's riches that he gave to Israel. Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace who hath made both one. So what God now considers you is you are now a part of him. 
You're no longer distant from him. You're a part of his family. You, Notice that the part, the being a part of this family is verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. So it's called the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church, which is why we call it church age, for some of you who didn't know that. So a more scriptural term is body of Christ, but we do it, uh, we call it church age. Dispensationalists call it church age because it's uh, more simple for us human beings to understand. If we call it body of Christ, it's kind of hard to tell if it's a timeline or the church is connected to that. But the body of Christ is the same thing with the church. So we are the body of Christ, but we are not in the times of the Gentiles. We are in the church age, not times of Gentiles. God don't see it that way. Returning back to Genesis 24, there's a lot of good stuff. This is a lot of riches I'm going to give to you here, pictures of the church. Yes, uh, yes sir. All right. Uh, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 24. And then uh, we'll look at verse... 56. Notice how Eliezer responds, the servant to the family, to the old family of Rebekah. Verse 56, and he said unto them, hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. So Eliezer says to the family, don't hinder me, uh, please don't stop me, because, I'm, because the Lord is prospering my way right now. I can see that God's hand is on me right now, so I want to keep this role going. I don't want anyone to stop this. Send me away that I may go to my master. Eliezer says, please allow me to go away so that I can return to my master. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit grieving and not loving this world. The Holy Spirit groaning. The Holy Spirit is groaning inside you and does not want to be in the night. The morning has come. Daylight came and he wants to go away. So the Holy Spirit groans so much inside you and groans for what? Groans to be with the Father. Groans for the Father. To be with the Father. That's a rapture. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. So Eliezer, all he can think of is, I want to go back to my master. I want to go back to my master. I want to go back to my master. The Holy Spirit is groaning within you and saying, I just want to go see the Father. I want to go see the Father. Go to Romans chapter 8. There's way too many pictures right here. There's no doubt it's pretty deliberate from the, from the author. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the what? Spirit. Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. See, that's referring to the timeline when God is going to redeem your body. And that's at the rapture when he redeems your body. He takes your body. He buys back the body, takes it up to heaven from the grave, up to heaven with him. So the Holy Spirit inside us is groaning for that. It yearns for that. It wants to be up with the Father in heaven. Go to Genesis 24 again. Genesis 24 again. And we'll look at verse 57. There's a lot more riches, brethren. We've just scratched the surface. There's a lot more riches here. Verse 57. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. So the family responds to this. Uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to call uh, the damsel, the young lady, Rebecca, and we're going to ask her. We're going to see from her mouth what she says. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? So the old family of Rebecca, they say to her, they ask, Are you going to go with this man? Will you be willing to go with him? 
Ladies, mark this verse down. This is one of the greatest verses for you women. Uh, there are several, uh, there are se there's a collection of verses I would love to preach one day. But for the women, uh, I have a sermon in my mind, the greatest sayings of women and the worst sayings of women. One of the worst sayings of women is Job's wife, curse God and die. One of the best sayings of women is Re uh, Rebecca right here when she was asked this question. She was asked this question by her old family. The world is beckoning to you, ladies. That's why there's magazines called Vanity Fair, Glamour, and everything. The world, it's all worldliness. Right. More, so, more than the men, the world is more attractive to the women. Right. So then, you ladies, what is uh, your saying? What is one of the best sayings in the Bible from Rebecca? Is that you choose to go with the Lord, go with the Holy Spirit where He calls you, and to leave the world behind. That's one of the greatest things. Rebecca responds at verse 58, and she said, I will go. She says, I will go with Eliezer. I will leave my family. I will leave right now. I don't have to stay for 10 days. I don't have to compromise with the world, make it half-half. No, I have decided to follow Jesus. When the preacher preached that sermon, I'm going to go down on the altar right now, get it right with God. Nothing's going to hold me back. This is one of the greatest sayings for you women. There's also Ruth. There's also Esther. There's a lot more. One day I would love to preach that one day. But I'm going to focus on Rebecca right here. So then the world is calling you, Rebecca, and the world is saying, will you go with this man? Now, did you notice that? Did you notice that? A lot of times we would think that it's the Lord giving us the call, and he does. He says, will you follow me? But if there's one thing you know about God, he, don't, he doesn't keep repeating it over and over and over and over and over and over again and begs. No, he goes by your free choice. If you say, no, I don't want to, God will leave you alone. There are times that once in a blue moon, he'll give that still small whisper and ask you again, hey, will you follow me? But he doesn't do it occasionally. He doesn't do it as much. You know who's the one that asks you that question the most? It's your flesh. It's the world. It's not you. You might go, really? Yeah, because when you hear that preaching, the voice you hear more so is not the Holy Spirit. The voice you hear more so is your flesh, the world saying, will you really follow God? Isn't it too difficult? Are you really sure you want to follow God? Do you really want to go to church? It's that world. Right. The world's voice, let's be honest, Christians, and if you lived your life as a safe Christian and know the struggle between the flesh and your spiritual nature, let's be honest, the voice of the world is louder than the voice of the Holy Spirit in your Christian walk. Do you really want to go to church today? Come on. We had a crazy wedding. Come on. Do you really want to go to church today? Aren't you tired? And That's the world. Yeah. That's the world, man. That's the world. Wilt thou go with this man? Look at Ruth 1. We have to match it up with the next greatest saying from a female character in the Bible. Look at Ruth 1. This is even better. This is even better in Ruth 1. There is no doubt a clear picture right here. A very clear picture of... The question being asked in a way that appeases the worldly mind. Because Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, asked her the question. But she actually doesn't ask her the question. She gives her a statement. So this worldly, this statement is actually more strongly alluded to the world than Rebecca's family. Rebecca's family is, wilt thou go with this man? But Naomi is saying, look at your family you're going to leave behind. Your friends, your homeland, your gods, your culture you're going to leave behind. And you're coming to a foreign land. I mean, just go back. D don't you see your uh, other sister-in-law going back? Why don't you follow her? That voice is uh, even more strongly alluded as the world from Naomi's mouth. Look at Ruth chapter 1. 
Notice in verse 15, And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Oh, so it ain't a question, it's a statement. You know what happens? Okay, it goes like this. The que it first starts out with Rebecca's old family. It's your situation and scenario, uh, ladies, and not just ladies, but everybody here, it starts out with the stage of Rebecca, then it goes to the stage of Ruth. It goes to the challenge of Rebecca, then it goes next to the challenge of Ruth. It goes out with the challenge to Rebecca, will you really follow God? Then you go, yeah. Then it goes to the challenge of Ruth. I mean, look at your fellow Christians around you, your fellow sisters in Christ, your fellow brothers in Christ. I mean, they even couldn't go to church that day, couldn't do soul winning that day. They, could, they did this worldly thing. They listened to that music. You've been in their vehicle before and heard them, and you've seen the stuff they had in their home, and it's okay. Am I getting somebody under conviction here? Real good. So why don't you go along with that? It's the world calling out to you. This is the greatest verse for women that Dr. Ruckman writes down, actually, when he uh, signs uh, uh, his name, uh, his signature on people's Bibles. He actually writes to the women, Ruth chapter 1 and verse six, uh, 16 through 17. I also believe it's the greatest verse for women right here. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. Man, I can preach a whole sermon right here. So then how you respond to the world when they say, Go back, don't you see your brother in Christ, sister in Christ? See, you can do that. You first have to call it out, Don't tell me that. Right. That's what you have to do. Don't entreat me. Don't compromise with me. Remember, Rebecca's family, what they were doing before, they were compromising. Ten days. The Gentile world is calling you. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. You know what that's a statement of? I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Amen. Where you go, I'm going to go. Where, I, where you die, I will die. Great statement from Ruth. Your God will be my God. That's an incredible statement. You women should mark that one down. It's an incredible statement. Go to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. So building up this drama, so to speak, Dr. Ruckman writes it down here at Genesis chapter 24, and verse 58, if you have a Ruckman reference Bible, uh, it will say this. If you look at the footnote number six at the bottom, it's a, it's a great thing that he wrote here. The verse is a winner if you consider what Rebecca could have said if she had been in the United States or Europe. Yeah, amen. Wilt thou go with this man? And she answered, well, I won't say whether I will go or whether I won't go. How many of you Christians say that, huh? Or, no, our parents are of a different belief. How many of you Christians are like that? Wilt thou go with this man? Come on. Or, I don't think I can hold out till the end. Wilt thou go with this man? I just don't have the right feeling. Oh, that's all over Christian churches. That's all over Christian churches. That's why those charismatic churches grow big, because they always rely on feeling emotion stuff, the speaking of tongues, and then they have to have that popular music in the background. Why? why? That feeling stuff. Wilt thou go with this man? It just hasn't struck me right yet. No, come on. Make an answer. Wilt thou go with this man? I want to think it over. Wilt thou go with this man? What will I do with my dear friends in the first Babylonian church that I'm leaving? That one's really good. Rebecca, remember, she was in a Babylonian region. Wilt thou go with this man? Why should I? I'm not a great sinner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you get that during altar calls. Wilt thou go with this man? I don't think I can live it. 
Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, the classic three words, I will go. That's good preaching. All right, verse 59. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. So then Rebekah's old family uh, sends away. They let go Rebekah. And notice this is Rebekah, their sister. The reason why is because she's considered part of the family. So when you're part of the family line, you're considered as brethren, so to speak. Brother and sister, that lineage. That's very common throughout the Bible. Jesus would talk about your brother to the Jewish people, but he's referring to a familial bond. Her family lineage, their people. It's referring to their people, physical people. So they send away Rebekah, they send away Rebekah's nurse, and then they send away uh, Eliezer, Abraham's servant. They let them go, and they let go Eliezer's men. So they all go. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. So then Rebekah's old family, they put their hand of blessing on Rebekah, and they say to her, You're our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. The blessing that they bestow on Rebekah is the same thing that God gave to Abraham, which is why Rebekah joins the family uh, line. Uh, Rebekah joins Abraham's family line because the blessing that the family gives to her is supposed to be Abraham's family lineage. Thus, it can apply to her. She, uh, they say that the blessing they give to her is that she would become the uh, mother of thousands of millions. There are two meanings right here. It can mean one as a metaphorical expression that she becomes the mother of many people. That's why it says thousands of millions. Or it could be more literal than you think. Thousands of millions, it actually means one billion. All right. For some of you who didn't know that, if you do uh, thousands of millions, it could be uh, one billion to billions. So then, if it's billions, is that really possible with the Jewish people? I mean, you don't get billions right now. Oh, right now, you don't know the future. That's right. right. In the future, the nation of Israel, they will rule this world, and then God gives them a whole eternity where they can repopulate. Yeah. That's the idea. So, I mean, they got a whole universe to fill. This is what the world's trying to do right now. Traveling to Mars, Musk has the station in Texas and everything. I mean, if you think that I'm joking, you haven't been researching. All right? I'm speaking from a secular point of view. Scientists have been so interested with the universe. They've been so interested with the universe. Stephen Hawking and some of these people talking about aliens. And they don't mean the aliens in the movies, but they mean there's some kind of form out there where it could explain our origins. So notice that the world, they're all into that. But God, he's been long ahead of them. Yep. He's been long ahead of them on that one. Because notice that the number of their people is going to be as the sand of the sea, as the stars of heaven, God promised. So that's a lot. That's going to number to billions. Notice uh, the next part of verse 60. Uh, verse 60, they say to Rebekah that her offspring, the sea, possess, let them own the gate of those that hate them. So any place that they uh, conquer, that they're, uh, especially those who hate the Jews, let them possess that, let them own that city. That, that's what they mean, the gate, because conquest and battle have to refer to uh, going up front the gate first. If you conquer the gate, then you can basically take over the whole city. Look how all the explanations I gave to you will match up with Genesis 22. Go to Genesis 22. With the Abrahamic blessing that God promised. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17. The Abrahamic blessing is given... To Rebecca, which is why Rebecca's family, old family, was able to say those words to her, and God was able to grant that. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 22. 
Genesis chapter 22, and we'll read verse 17. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. So this is God speaking to Abraham. Their seed as how, how much? Billions. As the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Okay, go back to Genesis 24. I've proven from this passage that Rebekah certainly had the Abrahamic blessing that God gave to her father-in-law. The Abrahamic blessing, I write right here, Abraham, is given to uh, Rebekah right here. I put the line over here because Rebekah pictures the church. Now, this physical blessing is given to the Jewish people. You'll notice that. And the mistake is, uh, I hope you're not mistaking that the church receives a physical blessing. I only did that because as a typology, all right, simply as Rebecca. I'm just too lazy to draw the line here. That's all, okay? Uh, the point is that the church has no physical blessing. It's the nation of Israel, the Jews, because it's Rebecca's offspring, Rebecca's children. Obviously, we are not Rebecca's children. Rebecca is a picture of the church, but only a picture, okay? It's only a picture. Pictures are not literal things that actually happen. It represents things. It typifies things. There are sometimes pictures can bring to pass something literal, but that's not often. To make it simple, God is simplistic. Pictures are pictures, that's the idea. We have pictures in this room of landscapes. Those are not real things, okay? Those are not real landscapes. Those are pictures. So Rebecca, again, pictures the church. However, literally, she is the mother and she, uh, is the, she produces the offspring of the Jews. The Jewish people come from her. That's why that blessing goes to the Jewish people. It's not the Christian church. Well, I don't see that with the Jews. Well, one, you should see part of that hand of God behind that blessing. Those Jews should have been wiped out so many times if you studied your history. Go back to ancient of ancient cultures. The Jewish people, out of all peoples, are the ones who survived with their language, their culture, and everything. Yep. Older than any other culture you can think of and people. It's insane. It's insane. You got, you, and if you study the war that went on with Israel when they started their nation, and then the Holocaust, and the Jews, they were kicked out of their lands and they were wanderers, they should, be, they should have become extinct so many times over. So there, the Jewish people is evidence that your Bible is real. Amen. Yep. Your Bible, Christianity, should be real just based on the Jewish people. It's insane. There is no doubt about that. There is no doubt about that. So there's no doubt the hand of blessing is on the Jewish people. And you don't see it now. They don't number billions yet. But you've seen part of that hand move in. And guess what? We haven't reached the end yet. When they reach end, end doesn't just end right there at the millennium. Once they reach the end, they got all eternity. So they got plenty of time to number to billions. Let's go to Genesis 24 again. Genesis chapter 24 and verse 61. And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. So Rebekah got up and her young maidens as well, and they all rode on the camels, and they all followed Eliezer. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Eliezer the servant took Rebekah, went along his way. Great picture of the church right here. Huh? <laughs> Verse 61, riding on a bunch of camels. Yeah! All right. Notice right here, I, I'm not sure if any other teacher uh, gave this teaching before. If this is the first, then I guess I'll be the first. But from what I can see here, the Holy Spirit takes the church along a journey. The Holy Spirit takes the church alongside a journey, and it's a long journey. You ever heard the song? Farther along, we'll know all about it. You ever heard the song about, uh, I'm walking home to heaven? It's not an easy road. We are traveling to heaven. No, no, it's not an easy road. What does that mean? That means as we're going through our Christian walk, the church goes through their Christian walk. It's called the Christian walk, right? What does that mean? You're walking. 
you got a long journey. Until you reach the end of life, until you can finally go to heaven, it's going to be a long journey. But in that journey, you're riding on a camel. Now, you might go, really? That's what camel means. Yeah, camel, believe it or not, camel actually ref represents journey. It represents your Christian walk. It represents your service. The camels, camels, are, what are they intended for? Journeys, a long journey, carrying burdens, carrying work. Are you seeing a lot of pictures here? I'll show you some passages. Go to Matthew 19 if you don't believe me. Matthew 19 and Acts 14. Matthew 19 and Acts 14. So camels represent your Christian journey, Christian walk. That's why John Bunyan wrote a book that became a very famous classic. I was very surprised when I attended school at Berkeley. They had that too. Pilgrim's, it's called Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress. If you think that was amazing that the liberal university gave those books for students to buy, isn't that funny? A bunch of atheists, you know, spending money to buy Christian books because that's part of their homework assignment. I find that pretty funny, you know. It's good for them, you know. Only spiritual thing they'll probably ever do in their lives. But uh, what's even more amazing than that, they were giving out Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So that was even more amazing. So I was, I almost said amen. I almost, I almost thought the cashier was saved. It was a safe Christian. <laughs> Anyways, joking aside, if we were to look at Matthew 19, notice what Jesus said. And notice what the Holy Spirit wrote at Acts 19. For a rich man to enter into the kingdom is very difficult and Jesus, Jesus uses this example. He calls it the camel going through the eye of a needle. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 24. <laughs> and again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, what is the eye? Enter into the kingdom of God. Do you know what that means? That's referring to your Christian journey. Look at Acts 14. Acts 14. If your hand's already there, then I'm going to immediately re read it, since I mentioned for you to turn over there before. In Acts chapter 14, notice that the Holy Spirit writes as the apostles were trying to confirm and then grow up the Christian souls at verse 22. 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. See? Growing in your Christian faith. Continuing in it. That we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. See, you have to go through a lot of trials and tribulations. You ever heard that before from people? Oh, I went through many trials and tribulations. It's been a long journey. Where do they get that idea from? It's all from the scripture. It's all from the scripture. They're going through that as a what? Enter into the kingdom where the Father is at. And it's going to, it's not an easy road, everybody, when we're traveling to heaven. Amen. But that's what those camels represent because Jesus used that journey, that spiritual journey, as the comparison with the camel going through the eye of a needle. In the mind of the author, if we believe it's God, that the author is God, what, why do you think he had camel right here and Jesus used the illustration of the camel and compared that with Acts? And not only that, God created the camel as an intention for long journeys too. I see this all, I see this all connected right here. I see this all connected. It's even stronger when you notice how many camels Eliezer took. Did you remember? Do you remember how many camels that Eliezer brought along with him? Ten, I think, right? So if we look at Genesis chapter 24, let me make sure if that's correct. Yeah, uh, verse 10, Genesis 24, verse 10, ten camels. What's the Christian walk? The Christian walk is during this Gentile world. 
So God connected it all together. God connected it all together. There is absolutely no doubt about it. In this Gentile world that we're traveling in, we'll need 10 camels to go through that. A lot of good pictures here. All right, let's continue on. I'm not done yet. There's a few more pictures here. Verse 62, a lot of great stuff. And Isaac came from the way of the well Lahiroi. Let me know if I'm cut off, okay? Uh, and Isaac came from the way of the well Lahiroi, for he dwelt in the south country. So Isaac, he's coming along. So he's coming down too. Oh, here comes the sun. He's meeting us part of the way. He's coming. Come on. Jesus is coming, right? He's coming along right here. And he's coming from the way of the well Lahiroi. So there's a well right here. It's Lahiroi. Why? Why did he come by this way? Because he dwelt in the south country. The south country is Beersheba. And then Lahiroi. Do you remember that? You forgot. Genesis 16. You forgot. This was a good chapter. Do you remember Genesis 16? It was from an Egyptian slave. When she ran away, she found a special place for her. And she gave it a special name. And for some weird reason, Isaac found that place to be special as well. Look at Genesis chapter 16. Look at verse 13. What did Hagar say about this place? And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Beer, what? Lahiroi, right there. Why is it Beer? Because of the area, Beersheba. That's why. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. Go back to Genesis 24. Remember, what did that mean? God is seeing him. God sees everything. If, this is even more amazing if you keep reading down, if God is seeing him, then Isaac, when he comes to this place, this is where uh, God sees everything and I can look after him, then he has a he sees this as a special communion with God. So does he have special communion with God? Yeah. Keep reading. Verse 63, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. See, Isaac realized it's a special communion with God. So he went out to the field during ev eventide, so during the evening, and then he was meditating in the field. Look at Mark 1 and... Joshua 1. Joshua 1 and Mark 1. You might recall evangelist Mark Wheeler. He would talk about that he was up there in the mountains and some part of the woods in North... Uh, I forgot what state, but then... Uh, during that time, he found himself a special place. And when he found a special place, that's where he would sing, shout, and glorify the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, I'm not talking about some kind of shamanistic thing that, oh, the, this is a surreal place and the Spirit of the Lord is in this place. You're standing on holy ground. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is there are places that are deemed very special to you where uh, you know that it was at this place and at this moment that God spoke to you very specially. God showed you some things very specially and it became very meaningful. Like when people do their Bible reading and prayer, you just don't do that in the middle of busy traffic. You have a special place to do that. Some people like to go out in gardens and do that or out in the balconies or some people like to look at God's creation when they do that. See, there is such a thing as special place where there's a meditation where there's a meditation on God. Look at Mark chapter 1. Jesus realized that, which is why he did the same thing. 
Uh, it's not new. Again, Mark chapter 1. Notice what Jesus Christ did. He, the Bible says he went into a solitary place and he spent time with the Lord. Uh, let's see right here. It's somewhere in this chapter. I'm having a hard time finding it. Uh, let's see. Oh, right here, verse 35, verse 35. And the morning rising up a great while before day, so that's Jesus, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Notice that Jesus realized that. Go to Joshua 1, verse 8. I'll read it. Notice you've got to meditate, spend time in the Bible. So not just prayer, but Bible reading as well. Joshua 1, 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Remember Genesis 24, Isaac made his way, right? Why was he meditating on the Lord? He was thinking about that Eliezer, the wife he's going to bring. He wants good success on that. That's the reason why he did that. All right, let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 24. This is a good picture. Again, I said Jesus Christ is making his way, right? He's coming for you. Notice it says where, where he... Uh, Excuse me. His direction was headed toward in the field. You see that? So he's coming in the field. You know what? Jesus Christ is coming into the world. He's going to come down into this world and then pick us up to rapture us home to heaven. Look at Matthew 13. Matthew 13. My goodness, I don't th I, I'm not going to be able to finish this today. Wow. I thought that I would be able to finish all these pictures. Look at Matthew 13. We'll wrap it up right here. There's so many pictures here. Matthew chapter 13. Notice what the field is supposed to picture. The field is supposed to picture the world. Verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So the field is supposed to represent the world, but notice right here that the context has to do with the coming of the Son of Man. It's when Jesus Christ starts to come down. If you look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. In the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Notice that rapture reference, right? There's a rapture reference where God is going to someday come down to the field, which is the world, and then he's going to make sure that his children get gathered together and come up inside his barn, Amen. go up to heaven with him. Yeah. All right, so hence we end the... We're almost done with the pictures. I thought we'd finish it today, but there's a lot more left. We'll uh, finish these pictures uh, next Sunday service. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teachings have been an incredible blessing to the hearers and made us realize what an incredible book, what an incredible book we have. And as the author, uh, you take pictures seriously. Uh, you told Moses not to strike the rock for a reason, because Paul mentioned that the picture was Jesus Christ as a rock being struck for us. Uh, thank you so much for a blessed book. What a miraculous God we serve. What an incredible God we serve. And help us to learn and be convicted and apply these concepts that we have learned on what the church should act and react. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.